Coming up on this week's show, more details about a lost rare RPG are revealed. The Amiga's most famous paint package comes to your browser. And we chat to Steve Jones of Checkmate Digital. And the Retro Hour podcast is brought to you each and every week with our amazing friends at Bitmap Books. Now, one of their books you need to check out this summer, Atari 2600 and 7800, a visual compendium. Bringing back those memories of that first era of living rooms all around the world lighting up to the look and sound of video games for the very first time. So you can check out that and the rest of their retro gaming collection at bitmapbooks.com. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 374, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And a very warm welcome to this week's podcast, the show that, of course, every week brings you up to speed on all the big happenings in the world of retro gaming and technology, lots of nostalgia laid into, and of course, we bring you a very special guest on the podcast in the second half. And hopefully you can't hear the ice cream van. Going down my street right now. I know Joe's probably got his shorts on as well. <laughs> Ravi's there in his shades. Summer is here, boys. I think it's been like nine degrees in the UK today. <laughs> I'll put suntan lotion on. And we I'm are recording this jo- at like nearly... I was going to say, I'm sat in jogging bottoms in my dressing gown. Get it right. <laughs> I can say we are recording this at like nearly 10 at night, so there's definitely no ice cream vans outside, but we are into that time of year now. And to be fair, summer, it always makes me think of just video game meetups because obviously things have been a bit weird over the last couple of years with, um, you know, the the thingy 19 that we don't talk about. But I mean, events are really back on this summer and this is really going to be our first one of properly getting back out there again, isn't it? And uh, it all starts next month. I mean, we thought we'd just kind of quickly go through a few of the events that we've got coming up. I know uh, we're going to be going over to Manchester. Ravi's definitely going to be there at that big format event, which is going to be a huge video game social that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, which is basically Ravi's going to be there because it's a party. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Manchester's a good place out as well. And there's going to be a lot of magazine people there. It's going to be a lot of kind of social and nightlife stuff. So that's a format festival in Manchester. And that's uh, format.gg. Yeah, that's going to be happening on um, the 25th of May. And uh, we have got a little uh, discount link if you want to save 25% on your ticket price for that that you'll find in our show notes. And then morning after that, I'm um, uh, flying straight out to Poland, to Warsaw, to go to Pixel Heaven. Now, I know you guys haven't been to Pixel Heaven before, but it's definitely one of my favourite international events. It's just a great little, it's a real mixture really, because you've got the the talks area, you've got a lot of machines that you can play on as well. But really like all of these events, probably my favourite bit is the social aspect of it, because you've got this great outside area where everyone can just chill out, have a drink, have a bit of food, have a bit of chat if the weather's nice as well. So um, I'm really looking forward to that. And I'm going to be on stage with David Pleasance, uh, formerly of Commodore, doing a panel that celebrates 30 years of the Amiga CD32 console which is incredible that it's going to be 30 years old this year. So if you want to join us for that, that's going to be happening on the 26th to 28th of May. Uh, You're going to be in Birmingham, Joe. Yeah, on uh, May 21st, uh, which is the Sunday before your guys' events just then. Um, I'm going to be at the Birmingham Games Market, Retro Games Market, with my friend Jason. Um, I'm going to be selling, actually, uh, on his stall uh, as Days of Thunder Gaming, actually, which I've done a couple of times with him now, but I've never really kind of said about too much about it on the show and stuff like that. But yeah, if you're down at the Birmingham Games Market, I'll be there um, selling games, wheeler dealing, Del Boy in, selling Mega Drive games, PS1 games, etc. Love doing it. Really, 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 really fun. And uh, sometimes people come up and say, are you Joe from the Retro Hour? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> That's all you have to do, isn't it? Just just say the say the code word, handsome Joe, handsome and you get Joe. 90% discount. 90%, whoa, wait, whoa. <laughs> Love that. And then, of course, after that, in July, all roads lead to Nottingham for a Ravi's massive Amiga event on the 1st and 2nd of July at Kickstart 01 at Meadow Lane Football Ground. How are you feeling, Ravi? 73 days at the time recording. I'm, to I'm your nervous, event. but I'm, I'm going to do this in an American announcement style. This is the big show. So, um, it's going to be good. <laughs> UK Amiga Expo, and it's on the 1st and 2nd of July. And we've got a lineup confirmed. So we've got Mike Daly of DMA Designs. Mev Dink of Vivid Image, Simon Phipps of Core Designs, and John Hare of Sensible Software. So uh, it's my first event that I've done. I've got a background of events, but uh, yeah, I'm totally nervous. But also, I'm well excited because I'm a huge Amiga fan. And, uh, you know, having an Amiga event in the UK in the middle of the summer is going to be great. 
And I think it's going to be Joe's proper Amiga initiation. I have to sit him in a chair and throw floppy disks at him or something. Joe's like, <laughs> what's an Amiga? He's going to get, be- me, get me down to the uh, Galleries of Justice and put me in. What are they called? You know, where they, they put your hands through the thing and your head through. Like oh, Gallows. Or, or, or the, the Iron Maiden. <laughs> yeah. We'll put you in the Iron yeah, Maiden. Just throw floppy disks at me rather than tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> so check out uh, AmigaShow.com for tickets. Yeah, so uh, links to all the events we're going to be at in our show notes as well. So if you're making it to any of these events over the summer, it would be very nice to see you there. And actually, our guest on the podcast this week will uh, also be at several of these events, including yours as well, Ravi, because we're going to be catching up with Stephen Jones of Checkmate Digital. Now, Stephen Jones is uh, an amazing character. I, I remember when I was a little boy, I used to go to these uh, Amiga shows. and When you were a lad. When I was a lad. I went to these Amiga shows and uh, Steve Jones would be there and he'd be, you know, showing off his cases. He'd he'd have some really interesting products and it all kind of collapsed and you know what happened with Amiga. It, it all kind of went down the pan, but um, Steven's actually come back and he's bought his great products back again. And what they are, are they're, they're basically cases that you can kind of rehouse the computers in. Originally it was for Amigas and now his cases support pc they support all kinds of stuff vr systems i've seen in some of them he's also now created a monitor as well that has more inputs than you can ever imagine you know it's got an input for absolutely everything you can even put like little boards in the back so you can have a you know the mister in there and uh kind of stack it and it's an ips monitor but in like a crt style so we're going to be talking about kind of what happened some of the plans that uh you know, he was talking to Commodore with back in the days, Gateway as well. So it's a really interesting interview, this one, and a must for Amiga fans. Yeah, because I remember reading about Steve's products in Amiga magazines when I was a kid. And you're right, his first product was a thing called the, the Checkmate 1500. What you did really is you unscrewed your Amiga 500, took the motherboard out, put it in this like desktop style case that made it like a, a desktop PC, and then you housed the keyboard in a separate case. So really what it meant is you had a very affordable, basically an alternative to an Amiga 2000 that would have cost you about two grand. Yeah. But you could get this, you know, the Amiga 500 was like, what, 400 quid? So really it was a lot cheaper than Commodore's offering, but they weren't all that happy about it, were they? No, they they weren't. (laughs) And he also created some quite crazy machines, which were like, you know, three machines in one. So you'd have an Amiga, a Mac and a PC uh, Mm. built into one case and you'd be able to switch before the uh, between them and this was like before virtual machines existed or anything like that so uh it's it's really interesting chatting with him and his new cases i mean he's been back in the game for a good few years now and uh ravi you've got one i've got one as well you've probably seen lgr's video and nostalgia nerds videos as well about the his fantastic new checkmate cases and the new monitor as well maybe even seen steve at shows he's been at events all over the world over the last couple of years so he's got a really interesting story and it's always great to catch up with him as well so stephen jones from checkmate digital is going to be our special guest on the show in around half an hour from now and it has been another busy week in the world of retro gaming and tech, and it's always nice to hear new stories from Rare. Now, in terms of companies that we've covered on this podcast and events that we've done, Rare have got to be up there and probably the most covered companies on this podcast. We've done so many shows with them and had them on lots of times, but it's amazing when new details emerge about things that we weren't all that familiar with. And uh, I don't know if you guys have been following Tim Stamper's social media post recently Mm. but actually he's been sharing quite a few hidden gems from rare you know i think the reason we talked to rare so much is because they're like that british developer that had that kind Mm. of nintendo edge as well and it's great to hear about uh, this coming out yeah i've been been following his uh his uh tweets if you will twitter recently i'm not on twitter i sound really old there but i've been following his posts and stuff on on the twitter on the twitter and uh yeah he posted a couple of weeks ago um some early builds of conquer's bad fur day and you know kind of revealing like how these games came about but what he did this week was a very very short 15 second clip of a game that was being made and it start they started making it in 1995 and it was cancelled around around 1996 but he shared cancelled game called dream which is a really interesting game because i hadn't heard of this but there's actually quite a bit of like legacy around this game and there's a few kind of like videos and there's even actually a documentary out there which is about 10 minutes long all about kind of like what happened to dream and it's got some of the rare crew on there paul makachek's on there which is really cool 
what this game was, it was actually a planned Super Nintendo game, um, which, you know, there's loads of footage of the Super Nintendo version of the game out there, but it eventually moved to the N64. And this is the first time anybody's kind of seen in public a glimpse of the N64 version of it. Now, I don't know if you guys agree or not, but it does, it definitely has that rare charm to it, doesn't it? Like in terms of like Banjo Kazooie, Donkey, Donkey yeah. Kong 64. You can tell just looking at it straight away that it's a rare game yeah. graphically. Because, I mean, it's got that, you know, the 3D, proper 3D that, you know, in 64 games had. The actual style of the game sounds quite interesting as well because it was basically uh, Rare's take on a role-playing game mm. and they reckon a, a dash of LucasArts adventure games kind of thrown in as well. And originally it followed the uh, the fairy tale inspired adventures of a boy called Edson. Yeah. Um, and he had to battle some pirates as well. And actually, I think the fact that this was kind of a, a cancelled game that never made it out there... The clip that he shared on Twitter <laughs> is probably quite fitting, because have a listen to this. Arr, so it's true then. The Nintendo 64 treasure does exist after all. How appropriate. <laughs> it's interesting, because we've heard this like project mentioned before when we've done interviews with Rare, but we've not seen the N64 um, mm. visuals. And it was originally planned for the SNES, so they like retooled it and redid it for the N64, which I think must have been quite a big process. You know, if you've originally hitting the snares and then you're going into this like 3D area, you know, I think maybe there must be some more behind it or there might oh. be more of the snares background and maybe hackers could kind of, you know, put something together or... I don't know. I, I I feel like, so the snares version of it is like a really nice isometric looking version of Donkey Kong Country. So it uses okay. those like silicon graphics. So I don't know, other than kind of like narrative and like ideas, I can't imagine much kind of came over to the N64 version from the SNES. But what's nice to see is a lot of the assets from the N64 version of Dreams were used in Banjo-Kazooie. So you know how I said it's got that Banjo-Kazooie look? Mm. The, the rumour is, or... I don't know if it's rumour or if it's fact, but a lot of these articles are saying that Dream did eventually become Banjo-Kazooie. Very different gameplay style and characters, obviously. Mm, yeah, obviously a Banjo-Kazooie um, you know, a fun platformer. Um, but yeah. the visual look of it, I'm assuming maybe the game engine was used for Banjo-Kazooie. And then apparently some of the RPG elements, in terms of the collectible area of it, was kind of repurposed. I would probably say more ideas were repurposed for Donkey Kong 64. But it would be interesting, like you say, Ravi, if somebody was to get a hold of us and take it apart and actually see, you know, kind of like that legacy of like what was in the SNES version, what was in Dream, the N64 version, well, and it, what was in Banjo Kazooie kind of thing. From what we got this tiny clip, but it looks like mm. it's only 15 seconds. You know, they, they've put a lot of effort into the kind of just voicing it, getting, you know, the, the character mm. model and stuff. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. And, you know, he's got the cart there. As well, you can actually see the huge kind of development car in the oh, video yeah, yeah. as well. With googly eyes that he's pinned onto it as well <laughs> in the, the video, which is quite cool. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is literally a 15-second clip. But very interesting to see. I mean, it looks like this is probably just a, an early cutscene from the start of the game by the looks of it. But then if you read more about the, the thread actually on Twitter, Grant... Kirkhope, who worked for Rare as well, he reckons that there actually might be some gameplay footage that exists as well. So obviously Tim Stamper, I mean, is one of Rare's co-founders, you know, the Stamper brothers. Very hard to get hold of for interviews. Trust me, we've tried <laughs> several times over, over the years. But it would be interesting to see if there's any more that he'll reveal. I mean, I do love the fact that he's delving into the archives and showing fans, you know, this stuff that we kind of had heard of, but who knows, we've never uh, seen before. Who knows what's in people's attics, you know? <laughs> Yeah, so I imagine that there's hopefully a lot more to come from Tim. So uh, definitely worth keeping an eye on his social media feeds. Will I keep you up to date with more as we hear it? But I'll link that up in our show notes. Want to check out that short 15 second clip of that in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, if we're talking about legendary applications, they do not come much bigger than Deluxe Paint on the Amiga. And for me, I mean, you know, that was when you, when you got an Amiga 500 back in the day, you get a bunch of games in the box. And everyone played them, you know, the, the Batman pack and cartoon classics I had, you know, Lemmings, Captain Planet, Bart versus the Space Mutants. Spent hours on those games. But really the only other thing that was of interest in there for kids was this paint package that came in there that actually, I remember the first time I booted up D-Paint, being able to make my own cartoons. Oh, yeah, was yeah. just incredible. That was one aspect of it. You know, it was it was so good for development as well. Like, you know, Joe 
oh, I've never heard of the Amiga, but he he's probably seen a lot of art that's been created on D-Paint and then put on systems like the Mega Drive and, uh, you know, the SNES. It's, it's a, a great development tool that was used and uh, it had such a, a kind of innovative way of doing stuff. Like animation is one thing that you mentioned. I remember a thing called Anim Brushes. So you would mm. select a brush and then the brush, you could go through each frame of the animation and the brush would change styles. It also had anim fonts. Um, it had ways of selecting different areas, color cycling as well, switching palettes. It was a, a really, really um, impressive paint program that its legacy has gone on to lots of different paint programs nowadays. You know, um, Photoshop has a lot of kind of elements that were originally in Deluxe Paint. Well, Deluxe Paint, I mean, it was really you know, late 80s, early 90s, industry standard really, wasn't it? Yeah. You know, for yeah. pixel art, really. That's, you know, all developers really use that in game studios. And like you said, you know, not just for the Amiga. I, you know, we've even spoke to people that used Deluxe Paint for stuff on the, the PlayStation, you know, the non-3D kind of stuff. So obviously, big legacy behind it, uh, made by Electronic Arts, by software engineer Dan Silver. And the reason we're talking about this now is there are a couple of new projects that aim to bring Deluxe Paint into the the modern world. Now, the the one that's been covered by a lot of websites recently is uh, this one called dpaint.js. And this is a completely web-based clone of Deluxe Paint. I mean, it works a little bit differently. Apparently, this started life as a an icon editor, but now it's turned into a fully featured pixel editor, uh, pixel paint program, layers. It's got masks, which I don't think the original Deluxe Paint had layers. No, I think... You've got selections, you know, blend modes. It can even... One thing that's really cool is it can import and export the Amiga file formats, the IFF files. That's, that's where I think this one has an advantage. So this is web-based. It has a layout that's very, like, GIMP or Photoshop. Um, you know, it doesn't... To me, it doesn't have that old school nostalgia, but it has that file format reading, which is really important because, you know, being able to convert images into that old format, into many of the odd formats that existed with the Amiga, but also have the palettes as well. So there's a great palette swapping um, section on there where you've got stuff like the Pico 8 palette on there. You've got the Spectrum palette that you can put in, Amstrad CPC, BBC Micro, and... uh, This is like really useful, actually, because whenever I used to try and convert an image to IFF, which was the um, Amiga image format, um, I would have to load up an emulator, then load it into that, have tons of RAM, (laughs) tons of stuff to try and reduce a a PNG and I'd put the PNG in there and then like reduce it down and there'd be all sorts of issues. But um, this one being JavaScript based, you know, you could load it up. You could probably even load it in a in a modern Amiga browser on a on a next generation system as well, and use it to kind of convert to these older formats, but then also have all these extra new features like layers and uh, blend modes and stuff like that. It does look handy. I mean, you know, today Photoshop has still got Amiga IFF support built in, so you can just save IFF images in Photoshop. I in did the, not know. Most recently. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And if you've ever used Irfan View on Windows, that can also do Amiga IFF okay. files. I mean, there are ways of using them, but I mean, this is really handy because one thing you can do direct from the menu is you can open an ADF Amiga disk image. Oh, cool. So yeah. if you've got a files on there, you can literally load them straight into this. And then there's even an, another option that says preview in Deluxe Paint. So you click on that and it will open Deluxe Paint 2 in a virtual Amiga emulator in your browser. That's excellent. Like, I think it's it's interesting that they've called it uh, dpaint.js and the main image is uh, Tutankhamun, which is yeah. the uh, <laughs> uh, kind of famous image that was on Deluxe Paint because it was just showing, you know, the, the, the great range of colours that you could have on there. Yeah, and I imagine Electronic Arts, you know, the fact they haven't made a new version since 1995 are probably not that bothered about kind of stepping on their copyright toes, hopefully. So I imagine this has got a good chance of staying up. But I think it's very useful for people that might have old discs, you know, full of Amiga images and want to archive them. I mean, you know, they could use this for that Andy Warhol. I I don't know how how this one would work with animation. Um, Yeah, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, but um, it's really interesting to see. And uh, I I just love the fact that it's kind of portable. It's just online. Anything where a browser will run it, you know. And there is another tool as well, if you want a, a more modern implementation of Deluxe Paint. This one's called Pied Painter. And uh, this one came to my attention because um, the author of this um, actually got hold of me on Twitter because 
I did like a, a, a retrospective of Deluxe Paint on my YouTube channel a couple of years ago, and he said he watched that, and that kind of inspired him to um, to make this new Python-based version of Deluxe Paint. Now, this one looks a bit more like the original. It's got the same user interface it's, and that's very like low nostalgic, resolution. isn't it? It's even the fonts, uh, uh, the Topaz fonts, which uh, are exactly the same, and uh, you can load in the example images as well. But it also has that anim menu up at the top so um you know you can do your animations dan and uh kind of play around like when you were a kid and python's really good as well because it's on so many different formats and uh you know you could run this on your raspberry pi and uh it it does look good and it looks like it's going to develop for me this is the one that i probably use just because of the nostalgia factor where the other one seems really quick you know this one this one for me would be like oh you know gives you the feels yeah, I can do my uh, my 10-frame stickman animations of the walking <laughs> process. Group. I was always crap in Deluxe Paint, but I just enjoyed playing with it. So uh, it is nice to have like modern solutions to uh, not only to be able to load up your own files, but you know, have fun with it again on, on a modern system. So if you're going to get hold of that, um, that Pied Painter, it's only in a uh, very early beta at the moment, but you can download it from GitHub. It is completely free. So I'll link up uh, both of those in our show notes so you can check them out. Now, we always love talking about these, don't we, when modders do incredible things with what are coming to be retro systems. The Wii probably is considered retro now. I don't start a debate or anything, but I've got to say, in terms of these kind of homebrew modifications, turning living room consoles into handhelds, this has got to be one of the most impressive ones I've seen so far. Now, this one is a glow-in-the-dark handheld Nintendo Wii. Well, it's a it's a little bit more complicated than glow in the dark, but yeah. <laughs> but it does glow in the dark, though. It, it does glow in the dark. You're not wrong. So, uh, yeah, this is the uh, the the glow Wii. It's called, and it's been made by a modder called Shank Mods, um, and he's got a video about it out on YouTube. Yeah, we've covered him before, haven't we? Because he did like he did a few other modifications. Yeah, I think he's done a portable PS2 and stuff like that as well. Yeah. He's done some really really cool stuff. So it, it is a uh, a reactive light portable Wii. So for those, I mean, I had to kind of do, do my own little research on this, but I know what I sort of know what reactive light is, but you know, the kits you can get or like the sound, the, the like light bars for your TVs. Yeah. You they get. used to call it aura or something. Yeah. So it'd be like, you know, you'd be watching a football match and the green would also yeah. be projected on the wall. Yeah. To be honest, I never really liked it. I always saw it, saw it as a bit of a novelty. Yeah, but I mean... It, within it this of, this device, it looks uh, quite good fun. Yeah, for me, I think it gives it more, like, a, a cinematic feel. Like, you know, when I've seen them, like, being used and stuff like that, you know, for, like... I think they'd look really good for, like, a lot of sci-fi films, like Star Wars and stuff like that. Yeah. But, yeah, but essentially, he's got this working on a portable Wii. So the article kind of, like, goes on and on and on about the fact that, you know, it's got the lights and everything there, and, you know, it's using... An, it analyzes the game and the video, and then it outputs the 74 LED lights, you know. But really, for me, it's the fact that it's a portable Wii. <laughs> that is yeah, a so this, Wii. This, this handheld Wii is called a G-Wii, and yeah. um, it was originally kind of released as as a device um, that was, you know, cut up bits of the Wii that were mm. put in there, and uh, it was a handheld portable one. But he's kind of got a transparent case yeah. on it, and he's also got a Raspberry Pi Zero in there, of course, which is controlling that kind of reaction. So um, it's controlling the LEDs to actually react yeah. with what's going on in the screen because you, you're going to need something. And that's where the kind of complexity comes in. I think it's yeah. like, you know, the original Wii that was impressive, but this is just mental. <laughs> like yeah. adding in a whole extra element. It's taking it to, to the next level, isn't it, really? Well, what I love about it is, I mean, yeah, it is a, a handheld device. It looks a little bit like a um, a Wii U gamepad, doesn't it, in terms of the, the layout? Yeah, that's what I the, first thought it was when I saw it. I yeah, thought, so did oh, I, yeah. they've just made a fancy Wii U gamepad, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it is completely transparent. You've got that reactive RGB lighting in there as well. And what it means is, basically, the edge, you know, the colours that you have in the display kind of bleed out into the area where the, the controls are, you know, the D-pad and the analog sticks. So really, it looks like kind of the the display is extending into the control part of it, doesn't it? It's a very immersive look, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it could be distracting, but uh, yeah, I'd have to have a play with it. But 
it also does look like it could be a complete drain on batteries as well. Well, funny you should say that. It, it does say that there is the battery life of it is only actually two hours when you're using the glow function. Um, it's closer to four hours if you turn the light off on there. But, you know, I guess that's the novelty of it. The fact that it has, you know, the ambient lighting with it. Yeah, well, you're powering the zero and also 74 LEDs as well yeah, on, exactly. top, on top of the Wii, yeah. Me and Joe have got Atari Lynxes and, ga- and, and Game, game Gears. Game gears. Yeah. That, that is fine, isn't yeah. it? You know? Yeah, two hours, two plenty hours. of time. Yeah, um, yeah really interesting. But um, unfortunately, he doesn't support motion controls. Um, and interestingly, on the video, he's playing a lot of like the uh, the retro games on there. You know, like you know, he's playing some of the Sonic the games console. and stuff. Yeah. So I guess maybe that's what it's probably more suited for because the Wii was a good console Plug your for retro games. Sensor bar in the top, and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I mean, of course, you can play GameCube games on it as well, mm, which yeah, yeah. is uh, obviously a really, really good use for it, you know, if you don't want games that support the motion um, sensor of the Wii. But yeah, I just think very cool. And, you know, th- these fan projects that just seem to be getting more and more impressive. So, um, yeah, it looks like a lot of work's gone into this. As it mentions in this uh, Retro Dodo article, you probably wouldn't be all that popular if you played that in bed at night with your partner. So maybe one just do <laughs> yeah. play, Playing it on the plane when everybody's trying to fall asleep at night like, on yeah, an overflight. That'd be too popular if you fly. Right, but, uh, <laughs> but check the video out. I'll put that in our show notes as well. Now, this is sad news. As someone who, you know, I've talked about this on the podcast over the last couple of months, really, that recently I seem to be getting more into physical media again. I mean, I've started buying more Blu-rays. I've even started buying quite a few secondhand CDs recently from charity shops and stuff. And I also do buy quite a few magazines these days. Now, obviously, I buy kind of the the independent mags, you know, Amiga Addict and Pixel Addict, but also I buy stuff like um, Linux Format, um, Retro Gamer Magazine, even picked up Mac Format recently. I buy a couple of, you know, DJ Magazine, I buy that as well. So I'm quite into having a magazine because I feel like you can just read them distraction free. You know, you're not, if you're trying to read something on the screen, I get tweets coming up and Facebook messages. And, you know, sometimes I read a, a copy of Amiga Addict on a, on a Saturday morning in the bath. It's bath also it good to not have uh, so much screen time as well, you know, have a bit of a yeah. break for your eyes. Oh God, I had a Zoom meeting yesterday that was an hour and a half and literally my eyes were agony afterwards, you know, just not looking away from a screen. Yeah. So I do get that, particularly if you're trying to read a magazine where you're focused on it. So yeah, having a paper magazine, I think is still something I really enjoy. But this is quite sad news. Now, this is actually the end of computer magazines in America. I didn't realise this, but there were actually only two remaining national computer magazines left in America, both of which, after almost half a century, are now officially over. Now, this is Maximum PC and Mac Life, both of which have announced that they're going to be uh, going off sale from newsstands and both going to be available in digital form only from now on. So that does mean that now, officially in America, there are no mainstream computer mags left. When I went over to America, there wasn't that many. And Mm. I had an American friend come over recently and we went into Smith's because he was like, oh, there's a meager addict in there. And he was like, wow, there's a whole technology section. You know, um, I saw some of the magazines there, which were quite interesting, actually. They mentioned in this article were 2,600 uh, the Hacker Quarterly still yeah. out there. And I actually got a copy of 2600 when I was there. And that's like a little printed kind of fanzine. Um, it's sad to see these two magazines going, but um, they're also both owned by Future Publishing as well, which makes me think, you know, maybe they've just pulling out of that kind of market. Um, it's it's getting increasingly expensive um, to produce, you know, magazines, but also... The paper's getting more expensive. Um, it's it's a really tough time for stuff like that with small margins. And uh, if you know if, if future have to pull out, they're, they're, they've got you know printing facilities. They've been doing this for years. They kind of know uh, what's what. It's yeah. It's it, it must be really tough. Yeah, that's that's a really good point actually. Because I mean, we know from having done a Kickstarter recently, and you know we're doing our own book, which which is going very well. If you know people have been asking. Um, but we know the cost of everything. Since we first came up with the idea 18 months ago, got the price of printing and paper, it's more than doubled. You know, it's been insane. So we do understand that it is a very tough time right now. And it is, it's just the fact that there's now going to be no computer magazines left on the shelves in America. Yeah, and it's a, it's a huge is, country as well. So like if yeah. you're sending out to every stall, nowadays they don't have a, a sale or return policy where maybe you could have, you know, got your magazines back and then sold back issues to people and stuff like that. Now they just kind of get trashed or or recycled. 
And uh, I can imagine if you're not selling in, in certain regions or certain areas in such a huge country, then it's really going to affect it. I think it's definitely that it's that thing, isn't it? You think it's always going to be there. And then mm. when when they do start to vanish, you feel sad about it, don't you? Like, oh, you know, I, I wish I still had the chance to buy them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That is true. Yeah, it's, it, it's it, seems, to go. it seems the more general ones seem to be going, you know, the ones that just have coverage of like Mac or PC and the, and the specialist kind of stuff's moving in. Like when I go into, uh, you know, WH Smith's, I know it's not a reflection of America, but when I go in there, there's all the hobbyist kind of stuff yeah. and the real like niche stuff where the general kind of stuff, a lot of people have started going to the internet for that. Or there's this, you know, delivery uh, services of getting them in PDFs and uh, reading them on uh, tablets and e-readers. It does kind of feel like, I mean, I buy Linux format every month and I get that in my just local branch of Asda. <laughs> they also have like, probably just get one copy in for me. Because he was a minor. <laughs> Here he is. Um, the Linux guy's in, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the month I miss it, they'll stop ordering it. The, the one I used to love was Micromart. I always loved Micromart. Yeah, and it, and it was that. a real pity when that went a couple of years ago. We're in that a few times actually, weren't we? Yeah, I'm yeah. Not sure, I remember, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, it, it is, it's definitely one of those kind of use it or lose it kind of things. But I mean, on the flip side of it, it does kind of feel like maybe it's moving more towards uh, an independent kind of hobbyist market now. And we have got, obviously, I mean, you know, you're involved in the Migra Addict Revy. It is great to see these, uh, you know, magazines popping up that are supported by their fans. So it's definitely not something that's going to completely vanish. If you want them, they are still available. I, I think, you know, maybe when prices go down and stuff, you know, there might be a return of these. And mm. uh, as you said, people are, are seeking like you know more traditional formats and older stuff maybe it's a, a strategic uh, move from that market so yeah very sad to see the end of a uh, mainstream computer mags in america but obviously there are options out there if you still want a, a physical magazine now being that this month is speeding by that does mean that next weekend it is going to be patrons hangout time now this is uh, it's always a highlight of the month isn't it and last sunday of the month Many of our patrons has, has want to come on. And that's the thing. I mean, it can be when we first started doing the patrons hangouts, like got two, two, three years ago. Now we might get five, six people on. Now we regularly get like, I think our, our record is about 44 people that we had on a couple of months ago on one of the hangouts, which uh, you'd think, I mean, having 44 people on a single call, that's got to be unmanageable, but it, it somehow just works, doesn't it? It just works. And, you know, sometimes, you know, we chat for the full two hours. Sometimes we kind of sit back and just, bask in the community and you know i don't want to say the community we've grown because of the you know the supporters have grown that if that makes sense and it's so cool like just sitting there talking to your mates you know talking about what's kind of happened in your life over the last month talking about what you've picked up what's going on um talking about ravi's event you know which i think is just absolutely amazing that he's doing that and that some of the guys for the patreon are coming over to the event, you know, from other countries and stuff like that. Yeah. Just, I think we have a lot of meat about me, like patrons. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. A couple of drinks and stuff. Just such cool. an incredible vibe and an incredible little community that, like, everybody's, like, kind of joined in on and stuff. I, I absolutely love it. Yeah, definitely my favourite bit about having a patron is just that community that we've built up around the show. You know, it's just amazing. And uh, obviously the support that we get financially helps us continue doing mm -hmm. this, helps us pay all our costs as well, which is massively appreciated. And also we do a, a bonus podcast every single month just for our patrons, our gold members and above. And we probably don't mention this enough, but actually if you join us on Patreon this week, you unlock the entire back catalogue. Yeah, we've uh, up to 33 episodes now, which... You know, I was actually kind of reflecting on that because of we were coming up with ideas before we recorded for our episode 34 of the Retro Hours After Hour, which we're going to be recording on Sunday as well. And uh, 33 episodes, you're like, wow, that's 33 months that we've been doing the, uh, you know, yeah. the Patreon for, which is just crazy to think. And, you know, how much it's helped us and helped us through, you know, like you said earlier on the old, uh, the 19 CR uh, scenario. <laughs> that we don't the like the event. Talk. Yeah, the event. <laughs> and just, you know, the fact that we've continued doing it, it's just absolutely awesome. But yeah, episode 34 is going to be here before the end of the month as well. And like you say, if you do join us now, uh, you will get access to all of those episodes. And as well as that, we do uh, give a ad-free episode and sometimes you get it out a couple of days early as well for the standard episode as yeah. well, don't you, Dan? Yeah, and also we're going to be doing an extra probably 10 minutes of new stories just for our patrons in a minute. We've got some really good ones to talk about. So you get extra content of the normal podcast every week. So very good time to sign up to our patron now. Uh, all the details are at theretrohour.com. And of course, when we get new members, we induct them into the world's most prestigious high score table in the world of retro gaming. And I'll let you welcome our latest member into the Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame. <laughs> a massive thank you to Marcus B. 
who joined us on Patreon this week. Thank you so much, Marcus. And if you'd like to join, all the details are at theretrohour.com. Okay, next, going to be going inside the world of Checkmate Digital. Some uh, very, very interesting stories from uh, the world of Amiga back in the day as well. And, uh, of course, these incredible new PC cases and monitors that he's making today. Steve Jones from Checkmate Digital is our special guest next on the Retro Hour podcast. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast and it is time to welcome on this week's very special guest. And actually, I can't believe that we haven't had our guest on this week for a full interview yet, being that he is someone who is just so well known in the Amiga scene, uh, particularly the Commodore and Amiga scene, actually. He's done so much over the last, what, 30 odd years? You might remember the, uh, the Checkmate. 1500 case back in the day and uh, of course the recent kickstarters he's been doing for brand new cases that look retro style a bit like the amiga 3000 and also this incredible new monitor that he's done recently as well so we'll find out all about that i'm sure and a bit of history as well with our special guest this week stephen jones how's it going steve uh, it's not bad thanks very much uh, no- nice to uh, be talking to everyone yeah, it's nice to have you on. I mean, obviously, we uh, we normally catch up at shows and events, and uh, hopefully there's more of those, I know, coming up this summer. So it's uh, nice to have a chat on the podcast, though, and kind of find out a bit about your history, because I know, obviously, you know, Ravi and I are massive Amiga nuts. So it <laughs> just is, a uh, bit. It's always nice. Nice to just nerd out about Amiga stuff with other <laughs> like-minded people. So, I mean, kind of going back to day one, we also like to kind of get a bit of background on our guests and find out where the story began. I mean, do you remember what was your first ever computer experience then what started it all uh, absolutely but i'm going to show my age now so i went to a school in london called st clement danes and we were one of the first schools to have a communication with london polytechnic but we used to at first we were said didn't punch cards i don't know if you remember that when you you, know, you could punch them or literally write with yeah. a pencil um and then shortly after that we got ourselves um a 300 board modem and a teletype. I don't know if you remember teletypes. So my they were first... uh, quite loud, weren't they? Oh, teletypes. They were yeah. <laughs> just dreamy. And I, I, I saw one at a museum not that long ago, and I, I literally cried. The smell and everything was wonderful. Um, so yeah, we had teletype, and for about two years, I was using teletypes, and we were writing software, and we wrote a Star Trek game, and all kinds of things back then. It was. It, it, we didn't have monitors, so it was all it literally every time we typed, you know, obviously with a teletype, it was on paper, so you wouldn't be able to do that nowadays. Um, but uh, no, it was absolutely fantastic, and that my, my lifelong obsession with computers started there. Well, I, w- I was wondering when did you first kind of hear about an Amiga and see one? So I dabbled with a couple of other computers, um, and I, I had a Spectrum and I had an Amstrad and a couple of others, but I'd, I'd read about the um, Amiga 1000 I think it was early 85 and I'd heard all about them but you of course they were like this mythical beast and there was a shop in um, Twickenham computer shop and they they had well, I was working over there and I actually saw one for the first time in the window running the juggler demo and of course that just blew my mind and it wasn't long after that there was a an, I don't think it was an Amiga show it was just a normal computer show in London and I went along and I had an uh, Commodore had an Amiga stand up there. And the first time I ever, I walked in I, and we was watching this guy doing this amazing stuff on workbench. And we thought it was amazing. We was all wondering, what's that boing noise? Was it like a bouncing noise? We couldn't figure out what it was. And then a few minutes into the demo, he said, if you wonder what the noise is, and he pulled the workbench down and the boing ball was bouncing. And we all stood there literally with our jaws on the floor. Um, and, and from then, uh, that was it. I had to have an Amiga. Yeah, because I remember, you know, a lot of people talking about those two demos you mentioned there. There was the juggler that you said you saw in the window. That was kind of yep. a uh, a 3D rendered robot juggler that was like, yeah, literally juggling balls on the screen. And that 3D graphics, I mean, it wasn't the kind of thing you saw on a home computer nope. back then, was it? No, especially yeah. in, especially paying back the animation in real time. Um, it, it, it didn't render obviously in real time, but it was done with a program called Sculpt. And that was an amazing piece of software and it would do ray traced images and they just put it together into an animation. It just, it just blew people's minds that you could do this on, on, um, what was it? What essentially a home computer that mm. fortunately wasn't my first Amiga. My, my first Amiga was, uh, I couldn't afford it. I'd had a young family and, um, there's no way I can afford it. Cause it, I think it was a couple, 1500 2000 pounds although at the time the, the 2000s were out as well or coming soon 
But they launched the 500, and as soon as it arrived, I think it was six nine nine pounds. And as soon as that landed, I went because I'd already got friendly with a shop up the road where I lived in Stanmore, and mm. um, they have a great little computer shop, and got friendly with uh, some of the developers in the back. And um, as soon as this, the 500 dropped, I, I bought one of them instantly. But I bought it and I took it home and I got my monitor. And and uh, the guy out the back who was um, said to me, "You you really like the 1000, don't you?" I said, "Oh, I, I just love one. Do you want to buy mine?" And are you kidding? Anyway, so he actually gave me a really good deal for it. Um, so I ended up with a 500 and I had a 1,000. Oh, wow. Uh, but the 1,000 was the one I used the most. I mean, I just I adored it. And, and I've still got it to this day. Um, and uh, I don't, the 500, unfortunately, was cannibalized to build the first Checkmate 1500. But um, the 1,000, uh, no, she's, she's, she's still sitting under my desk. Yeah, and I love seeing that in your YouTube videos as well, that original yeah. Amiga 1000. Yeah. It looks looks like it's straight out the box still. It looks brand new on your desk. So yeah. I, you've obviously taken care of it. Yeah, I I, I, I mean, I, I, well, one story was I, it was actually left in the garage. I, I, we'll come to the gateway later, but after the gateway thing, she was actually left in the garage about 10 years in the box. And um, But I got her out and I cleaned her up. I, I found recently that I did, I'd never wanted to retro buy her because I don't want to put chemicals on her. But someone said about putting her out in the sun. So I tried it with some old 500 cases, and it does work. And and I and I and in the end, once I realised I hadn't destroyed the 500 cases, I stuck my 1000 out there and the keyboard and what have you, and it brought it back up to a, a really nice, not not like new, but it, it clean enough and got rid of most of the yellowing. So um, she she does look absolutely fantastic, actually. And of course, she's got a vampire, a V2 vampire in her as well. So she's as fast as anything. So. Well, the Amiga had two kinds of worlds. It had the uh, wedge machines, like the 500s, and then it also had the big box machines, which were yeah. more expandable and stuff. You mentioned that you'd prototyped or started making a Checkmate 1500. What, what, why was that needed? Okay, so let, let's let's step back just a, just a second. So at that, at that particular time, most people weren't playing games, and there weren't many games for the, the Amigas at the time. I think the only one was like Marble Madness and a couple of others like that. Everyone was trying to create graphics. I, I was trying to do 3D animation. Um, I wasn't very good with D-Paint. I could do some basic stuff, but I was really good at uh, videoscape and stuff like that. So most people were trying to make a living from the, the facilities you could get from the Amiga. Um, but I got friendly, as I said, the guy who sold me the 1000, his brother, uh, w- was designing a computer case. Okay. Cause I never designed the original 1500. And so he, the guy invited me to James Campbell, who became my partner. And we kind of came to an agreement that, um, myself and James would market the, the cases on behalf of these other guys. And so, you know, we, we basically, the, the idea was that the 2000 cost a fortune back then. Um, I mean, it was really expensive. and But you could buy a, a 500 for, at that time. It actually dropped about like 500 pounds. So for 500 pounds and say two or 300 pounds for the case and then a couple of hundred pounds or a bit more for an accelerator, you could build a really good machine for about 11, 1200 pounds, which is about half the price of a 2000. And so whilst it, but it was never that popular, I'll get to that point in a minute, but it, everybody loved it. But the trouble is in the UK, most people started to use the Amiga for games. You know, the Batman pack had come out. Um, and so a lot of people were buying and using it for games. And we, or whilst we went to certain shows uh, to show it off and like in a big music, you know, synthesizer shows and we went to... Um, desktop publishing and we went to a, a CAD show and that kind of thing to show off X CAD and um, I think we I think back then it was bars and pipes. So we tried to show it off professionally. And we sold it we sold a few, but we did we didn't sell that many. Um, but um, it was mainly because it, it 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 was a very slim case. So you could build basically what most people wanted was a was was a 500 with an 030 and say eight to 16 megabytes of memory and maybe a flicker fixer and you could put oh and a hard drive and you could stick all of that inside our case so, so it, was, it was basically saving a lot of money and you could yeah. rehouse everything so i even yeah. saw that you had um the keyboard could get taken out and then yeah. Uh, yeah. rehoused yeah. we had a little case and we had a nice c- um, cable set that would connect it between we had a really nice curly white cables made so they looked really nice 
And also, it was rack mount. It was the it was a rack mounting size. So some musicians would literally stick it in the rack with their with their gear. And so it was it was a great. And it was the other thing. Of course, it was really strong. Um, I mean, as people probably know, I used to stand on it. Um, technically, I mean, I could have driven my car over it. To be honest, <laughs> uh, it was that strong. I remember um, um, you being famous for standing on. I still <laughs> case, do it. so many photos of you standing on it. <laughs> no, I still do it. Um, but with the with the new ones and the plastic on the front, I'm a bit more careful. But with the other one, you could literally drive over it and wouldn't have to worry because it was folded metal all round and welded. So it was just, it, you literally could have driven a car over it. Because so I do remember reading about the you know the Checkmate Digital, the, the Checkmate 1500 was the the name of the first um, case you brought out back in the day. Yeah, I remember reading about that in magazines like Amiga Shopper. Um, and basically, yeah, you could turn your Amiga 500 into a professional desktop machine. I mean, and it was all made of metal, you know, since you've, you've showed the original machine at, um, at shows and stuff. So I've, I've had my hands on it and it looks like, you know, really well built product. So what was kind of the, the process of building that in regards to, you know, production and prototyping it back then? Well, as I said, it was actually designed by, I I've forgotten the guy. Well, I'm not surprised I forgot their names, to be honest, after what happened. But there was a, it was a, it was the guy I met in um, this shop in, uh, it was his brother and he designed, he's a lovely bloke. Um, and he designed it, he actually designed it on Amiga using XCAD. And so he did all the work. And if, the, the irony is he, he used the same uh, metal fabricators as I use now because I chased them down. He used a company called Henderson Fabrications and um, in uh, Northampton. And so it obviously took a few attempts to get to, to, to make it, these things too. But um, the good thing is it was all folded steel. The keyboard was case was aluminium, but the main thing was steel, not like the modern 1500 with all the plastics. Um, so it was fairly straightforward, but a, quite a complex thing to weld. But um, it took him about three to six months to finish the design, and, and then we launched it. I, I always forget the name. I think it's Personal Computer Weekly or Popular Computer Weekly, and we, we got in touch with them and um, said, would they be interested in uh, doing something with it? And they came around to the photos and they, they smacked it on the front page of the magazine. And I think that was the thing that first um, piqued Commodore's interest, shall we say. Yeah, but that's quite interesting because Commodore kind of famously produced all their own stuff and, and, and wouldn't work with, you know, third parties or, or other kind of companies. Um, but you'd found this kind of gap in the market between the two ranges of machines. Um, <clears throat> what was their reaction to the... Uh, 1500 like oh, i'll try not to use the language that, that they used when i met them well initially they they um they called they called us up and uh cause didn't have email then um they called us up and said uh would we like to go in and meet them and i spoke to james now of course i was the should we say the face of the, the business and james was the technical guy and the businessman at the you know the back with the experience and he said well let's go let's make an impression and at the time, everyone was showing off. Now, James happens to have a black Porsche Turbo. And so I, I said, well, it, well, first thing he said was, let's take you down and get you a decent suit to turn up in. I said, oh, okay, because I didn't, I didn't have a decent suit. And um, I said, well, do you think it'd be a good idea if I turned up in your car? And so I said, yeah, sure, why not? So he assured, he assured me on his car for the day. And um, so, but we honestly thought that they were going to, you know, want to discuss, you know, what we were doing in, in a positive way. So um, I jumped in the car and drove up there, and I think I did a wheel spin as I went in the, into the uh, car park, as you do. I <laughs> uh, made a bit of a noise because, you know, look at us. <laughs> I was such a child. <laughs> um, and uh, so I got out of the car, and then I walked in and sat down, and then I was invited in. I always can never remember if it was Kieran or Kelly. There was two some of the brothers. It was one of the two, and I always get them muddled up. Because Davy wasn't around at that point, I think he was in Switzerland. Anyway, I went in and I sat down, and we did, you know, the usual pleasantries. You know, how are you, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then once we finished the pleasantries, um, they basically said, "Right, this thing about your fifteen hundred, you're affecting our sales. We're going to add your own expletives here. Uh, we're going to wipe you out. Um, either kill you or wipe you out. It was one of the two. And I was sitting there. Like, what? <laughs> what? 
Uh, you're, you're ready to sign a contract to work with them at this point I, or something, I, I thought guess. it was, I just thought it was going to be something like, you know, look, stop selling that rubbish, right? Sell our machines because we'd been doing all the shows, you see, and there wasn't many people really pushing the high end. I thought they were going to do that, but no, they, anyway. So my fav, my favourite um, part of the discussion after the, because he, he did sound a bit like, um, and he was, I want to be Alan Sugar before, obviously Alan Sugar. But he said to me, uh, right, how many, how many, how many you've been selling them things? And I said, um, oh, I don't know. I think we sold about 300 so far. <laughs> 300? Thought you were selling thousands. No, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> and they, I think this is the problem, you see. I think they thought because they weren't, they were the 2000, the 500 was, they couldn't make them quick enough, but the, the 2000 wasn't selling in huge numbers. And I got the feeling he thought we was affecting it, but we wasn't really selling that many, you know. I mean, I sold more of the new 1500s by a factor than the old ones. And, yeah, so anyway, so I, I do remember saying, I, I guess you don't want to work with us then. Um, <laughs> so it was quite a short meeting. I think it lasted about 10 minutes, and then I left and came back, and uh, obviously a bit disappointed. But the the reality was, not long after, and I don't know, I can't remember how how many months, but not long after, they managed to get some fifteen hundred stickers made, and slapped them all over the two thousands. But that wasn't the issue. the The big problem is they slashed the price mm. of the two thousand and made it the fifteen hundred. Didn't include a hard drive and just had two floppy disks in it. And eventually, they were selling it for like nine 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 or something. It was around that kind of figure. So basically, that killed us off. Um, yeah, because I mean, you, you think of the Amiga 500, that was like £400, and then yeah. the 2000, I think, was about £1,500, wasn't yeah. it, to buy? So there's been you know, a £1,000 difference between them. So were they threatened by it then, obviously? And why do you think they didn't embrace third party solutions and want to work with you? Well, they, they didn't really know how to sell the Amiga. They knew how to sell. David Pleasance was brilliant at selling the, the 500 as a games machine. He was, he was fantastic at that. But actually, selling the high end side, I mean, it was very niche. Um, you had to know about it. Whenever we went to shows, it, people people absolutely loved loved the things. The big problem was obviously businesses wouldn't buy five hundreds um, because they're just a games machine, which obviously it's not. But that was the impression. And when you start talking about the cost of a two thousand, you know, they, they most of them didn't want to take the risk. So it became like a, ne- a very niche product, and they, they didn't really do much. And I think they thought that we was. I, I think that they thought we was, you know, affecting their sales, but there was no way we was. But uh, I can see what we would be annoying, you know. But they were selling there just such a – it's so expensive. People couldn't afford it. And it. So you basically got the same performance and you got everything you needed, but but cheaper. So as soon as they dropped the price, killed us off. And then – so, of course, nowadays it's quite funny because people people like to um, get – I mean, even I've – even funny enough, I've got a 1500. I peeled the sticker off, obviously. But I've got one of the 1500s because it had a new motherboard. And so that sits on my desk next to my 1500. <laughs> I, I always thought the price difference between the 500 and the 2000 was, you know. Oh, yeah. It's really, it was the same machine. It just had slots in, didn't it, really? Yeah, you that know, was it. To put expansion cards in and yeah. had a big case. And it seemed like a thousand pounds more for it. So it seemed a bit excessive. In the early days, I mean, it was like two grand. Yeah. I mean, by the time you had it on a monitor and you put a hard, a hard disk was like 800, uh, you have to forgive my memory on this, but I, I vaguely remember like 700 to a thousand pounds for a hard disk. Um, yeah. And then, you know, your RAM was really expensive and accelerator, you had to sell a kidney. That it was, it was a very expensive thing to do, but then the computers, high end computers were expensive and what you could do with them was just nothing else could do it. Um, and that was so, so if you was in the know, you bought one. Well, you mentioned uh, shows there as well. Um, were you going around the world to like a, a lot of shows and were there any standout ones for you? Oh, to be fair, we mostly did the UK. I, I, I did about half a dozen shows in the UK. We tried to go in, as I said, we went to a, a synthesizer show once, um, a music show. We did um, a CAD show. Um, no, I don't think we, we didn't do a desktop publishing one, but we did those those kind of, you know, CAD and the, the business kind of shows and just books and we even we we hired a, a model once which is quite funny i don't know only did that once didn't do it again but i did go to obviously we obviously went to the amiga shows they were they were fantastic i mean the world of amiga the, the world of amiga went on i think it was two or three years and uh, were the absolute pinnacle um, the world of amiga was fantastic 
I'm pretty sure it was like two or three years on the trot and they were absolutely amazing. Um, we, I, I, I've always liked doing shows and I, there was one of my favourite favorite things, to be honest, you know, going there, meeting everyone. Everyone's so excited to, to see what you're bringing next and I used to get my stands for almost nothing because the organisers wanted me there to show something new, you know, because what used to happen, they'd come to my stand They'd have a look at our stuff and then go to the next one and buy all the gear, the gear off of them. They buy all the the third party stuff, and so yeah, it was it was uh, it was it was great fun. It was good, also good meet people. But, but I always liked the I did like the um, the American shows. I mean, we only went to a couple of them because obviously you can appreciate it. it was quite expensive back then. And I was because I've always been a bit shy. So but, but you just, people see me on the stand and I'm this loud brash thing, but it's, that's not me. So I went to the new tech party and I was sitting in the corner you know, just watching it all going on. But it was absolutely fantastic seeing it, seeing everything happening. But yeah, it was uh, those, the thing was that the other my favorite thing about those days, especially the I ha- hate to say this, but the UK ones tend to be largely games. It was games mm. publishers. But the German one, which we used to do German shows, the German shows, the American ones were, you know, business, uh, you know, like uh, video professionals. Um, graphics artists that kind of thing and so they, they, there was games there but not very much so it was a completely different thing so the uk was very very much games well, i remember the amiga scene around then so i mean I, I got into the amiga 1991 i got my amiga 500 plus and then i remember the amiga 600 coming out the year after that felt like exactly the same machine <laughs> just a smaller case and yeah. we finally got the amiga 1200 and yeah, well, that's the thing. And then the 1200 came out that had, you know, more colours, but really it didn't feel like a massive leap forward. And we've got the CD32 console as well. I mean, what did you kind of think of these kind of newer Amiga models that were coming along? And did you kind of see a decline in the Amiga scene? Did you preempt that kind of coming? I don't know about preempt it coming, but um, as soon, I don't want to be careful what I say here because I don't want to insult Dave Haney. Um, but he, I think he'd agree with this anyway. To me, the, the twelve hundred was was perfect. It was the it, it was a great little upgrade. Yes, we could all we all want little bits more, but it, it did the things that you wanted to do. But the four thousand, from a professional point of view, you know, I'd been selling graphics cards to people for years. Um, they all wanted twenty four bit graphics. They all wanted RTG and that kind of stuff. And the, we hoped that the, um, Commodore would have released a, a true twenty four. But even if they just did their own RTG system, you know, an official RTG, not rely on third parties doing it. That would have been good. But it was, to me, whilst it was the 4000 was a good machine, it was too, too cost reduced. I mean, I always say we had a couple of extra bit planes and that was about it. Um, the, 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 even the 3000 um, had a better SCSI interface because at the time SCSI was the way to do it because it was fast multiple devices. Now with hindsight now, IDE is actually quite good because we can put compact flashcards in it. But at, back then, you know, you had to put loads of stuff in it to, you know, it puts you had to put a, a SCSI controller in if you wanted to to run lots of drives. You had to um, put a you know a high end graphics card like a Picasso at the time. And it wasn't being done by Commodore. And, you know, we all know the stories about the AAA being dropped and all of that, but I think the, um, it needed a true colour display at that point. For the 4000, definitely. And it, to me, it was always a step back. Apart from the, the two extra bit planes, it was a step back from the 3000 because obviously you probably realise I'm a huge fan of the 3000, which I think was the best Amiga ever made. And a lot of people um, may well disagree, but... For the time, it was just just outstanding, and I just think it was the I think it was the best one. The, the three thousand tower is obviously even better, but yeah. So you stick a graphics card in it, you've got an amazing machine. It was absolutely wonderful. So I, w- I was wondering, like, uh, what it was like after the bankruptcy and when Escom Computers ended up uh, taking over Amiga. I think they owned it for a couple of years. Yeah, I didn't have anything to do with Escom. Um, now I always get computers. I, th- I think it was Gateway bought it off of Escom, didn't they? Uh, yeah, yeah. So as Commodore, well, I mean, let me give you a scenario. So basically the the problem I saw it was that the PC was going to win and Windows was going to win. There was no way it wasn't going to win. It had the, the, an ugly CPU, but it, it was brute force and ignorance. It was going to win. And Windows, it was obvious, through, well, one, three, one, and we knew what they were working on. When Windows 95 came out, that was it. That was the end of it. So <clears throat> I know an awful lot of people who were using Amigas and 
this is where I'm kind of jumping the gun a little bit here, but the whole Siamese thing. So I didn't really have anything really to do with SCOM. Uh, in fact, I didn't have anything to do with SCOM. I don't think I've ever spoken to them or anything, but I was concentrating on the whole Siamese. Um, and we're trying to make it so that any of your Amigas could easily link with the Windows PC and enhance the capabilities of the Amiga and give you this kind of hybrid thing because I like the idea of two operating systems working seamlessly as one. Um, yeah, I, I, I'll just explain that to listeners because yeah. it's it's a really interesting idea which was kind of linking an Amiga and a PC. So you had the best of like both worlds. Now days we have like virtual machines yeah. and uh, some people call it like a rabbit hole as well. But um, this was basically connecting the two machines, sharing resources, and uh, you developed this system to do it. So basically it started out, I I met up with uh, Paul Nolan, who wrote Photogenics, works at Google now, funny enough. And uh, I talked to him that what I wanted to do was, um, James had agreed to make a video switcher for me because my my thinking was this, if you've got a 1200, for example, which is a good, machine to do this with uh, i used to make this product called a power station and it was basically a box you could put drives in it had a power supply so it was quite st- nothing fancy but it was an inexpensive way of supercharging your mega so i used to buy loads of se- i was called secret squirrels do you remember the high soft squirrels uh, were, were they scuzzy squirrels which scuzzy, were kind of interface. A, yeah a, a way of having um even cd-rom on the amiga and stuff yeah. like that yeah. So we put all that into this big tower. And I thought, well, why are you doing that? Why not just stick a PC motherboard in there and make a hybrid? So we built that into it. But to make it work properly, two things were needed. Firstly, we needed the Amiga keyboard and mouse to control the Windows machine. And we also needed a video switcher so it would switch the two displays depending on what screen you're working on. And it was all automatic. And Paul Nolan wrote the software to do that integration. Now, that was the first version, and that sold really well. Um, if I had not so much in the UK, but in Germany, it sold loads. Um, and I was talking to to um, New Tech about that uh, because they were thinking of doing something similar with um, Alpha machines. But then um, Paul and I, we always had this debate about um, well, whose idea was it? And I'd actually gone to Paul and said, "Is it possible?" Because we was using the serial interface at the time. Is it possible to to make Amiga Windows appear on the PC display. Now, it was a very simple suggestion, but within about a month to eight weeks, he started, the first thing he did, he created a thing where you can move empty boxes, just line-drawn boxes around the Windows screen, and they were Amiga applications. All right. Okay, I get it. That's just stunning. And within a month, he'd rewritten the Amiga's operating draw commands on Windows, and all you had, all you had to do, it, the whole thing would rebuild an RTG system on the Windows in a Windows m- window, um, and that would be your Amiga. But it was completely redisplayed. Now, it it was as fast as a graphics card until you started sending lots of graphics, and then of course, you, if you're at serial speed, it's no good. So then we did the um, network interface, um, and that just made it faster than the Amiga graphics cards. Um, and that was really, the, that was called the RTG system, and that was version 2.5. And that sold even more, especially, again, in Germany and America, and not so much here. Um, and that was, that was a great little product. And um, uh, Because obviously about that time, Gateway had, um, were, I think, about to buy the Amiga or just bought the Amiga. And I met Mick Tinker uh, in a German Amiga show. And he kind of sidled up to me, said, he pulled me over to one side and he, he opened up his briefcase. He said, uh, here, have a look at this. And he opened it up and I only needed to see it for about three seconds. And I instantly saw a PCI card with a, 68, six, a 6840 on it. And, uh, oh, wow. I said, "That's we can put our software on that. And they said, yep. And um, so we kind of forget how the whole communication thing got, but, but – um, Gateway, obviously, I think we told them about it, and then they invited us, you know, sent us some tickets to go out to see them and um, to show them the card. Um, and the the but the PCI Amiga card was going to basically be a miniaturized Amiga on a PCI card with the chips. 
running our Siamese system, which had RTG on the main Windows desktop. So you'd basically you had a hardware version of a virtual machine, if that makes sense. Um, you plug that into a standard PC just, and you'd have an Amiga on a card, really. Basically, yeah. And it was a PCI yeah. card. So the bandwidth was enormous back then. I wanted to sell them on the idea of like, his Windows machine. Uh, it was basically you build their high-end Windows machine would have this card. So it would be Windows and Macintosh compatible. Now, this is before Steve Jobs came back and stopped all this. This is before then, when they used to license out the operating system. So you could have both on there. And, of course, we'd have the Amiga in it as well, because I wasn't not even enough to think that they were bothered necessarily about the Amiga. But for us, it was a case of making that you'd have this, you know, x86 processor with brute force. You'd have the card running all the Amiga's graphics, and you could still plug it into normal video displays. Um, and then ho- my hope was that, that over time we could port the operating system to x86. Now, that was then, not now. I wouldn't do that now, obviously. But back then, port into x86 made made tons of sense. Now, that the they actually signed um, uh, what's called a letter of intent and gave us 50 grand between the three of us. So we kind of went back, thought we were, that's it, we're done. But I didn't quite understand the difference between a contract and a letter of intent, um, which is probably naive on my part. So we were going nuts, I'm getting this all ready and so on. And um, uh, one of the things, and I always admit to this, it was, I made it, I did make a big mistake because I thought everything was set. I, I started taking tiny deposits off of people to buy one of the card. They pulled the plug. So Gateway said, oh, we decided not to do this. And so uh, I pulled the plug and basically that that just wiped me out, literally, because I put all my eggs in my basket. Um, unfortunately, a Mick and, if 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 we'd had the card from Mick, because he ne- I never actually technically I never actually saw it run. I took it took his word for it. I'm sure it did work, but we never actually saw it work. And but it looked complete. But he never gave us a working one because if he'd given us a working card, we could have made the product. Um, but that's obviously one of the. Unfortunately, sadly, after all this, the whole thing fell apart. Paul and I haven't spoken since. Uh, Mick and I have. But um, yeah, that's that was kind of a sad story, and uh, a whole load of um, other things ensued, which I won't go into. Obviously, personal stuff, but um, house and everything else disappeared, and all that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, it was a bit bit of a bit of a bit of a sad period. It seems a strange move from their perspective too, because I mean, obviously, we had these big companies that were buying, you know, the Amiga and Commodore assets. You know, Escom was the biggest PC manufacturer in Europe at the time. Gateway Two Thousand, massive American company, and it does sound like that. If you had this card that you could put into their high end PCs, it would run, particularly Macintosh software, like you said. I mean, you know, it just felt like that would have been a real big seller for them. It just seems a bizarre choice that they didn't see the opportunity or for some reason change of mind. I think the the I think the reality was that they wanted the patents to negotiate better deals on on parts for their PCs. And so that's really where it ended because they were quite happy to hand it over to the Amiga uh, a separate company, Amiga company without a problem. So and that's where I think Mike got the um the licenses sorted out. Thank God he did as well for the operating systems. Uh, you know, the, the, they were talking a good talk. The reality was um, that they didn't really go through with it. But I, I, I mean, I kind of look I, ironically that it wasn't that long ago that, that, that after that that they end up dying anyway. So, uh, which you know, is, which is sad, obviously, for people involved. But the uh, meager curse again, I think. Yeah, it was kind of like the uh, wilderness years when they um, <laughs> oh, when, God, they, yeah. when they went away. Um, I was wondering, like, I, I saw one thing that you did, which was called the cluster system, which oh yeah yeah, yeah. was very like the Siamese system to me, but even madder, <laughs> which is um, uh, basically a Mac, a PC, and Amiga all in one case as well. Uh, so <laughs> let me let me let me correct you slightly on there. So I had um, there was two systems I was working on. One was uh, the multi OS machine, which was literally it was um, uh, a box with three trays in it that could hold three different computers. And you'd have a, I'd have an Amiga in one of them, and I'd have a Windows machine and another one, a Macintosh. And it was quite a big box. I mean, it was nowadays you're doing a VM, you wouldn't even think about it. But back then, people weren't doing it. And I kind of made this hybrid, and it all worked together. 
So um, that that was that. But I also I wanted to, hence my my email address is cluster. Well, it used to be cluster UK because uh, I wanted to get into Linux Beowulf clustering, and um, so I built this um, thing called the. Uh, I don't know, I forgot what it's called. That's gone on me. But it was, a, it was a cluster. It was a box. Oh, the eight, the eight pack. That's right. The first one was called a three pack, and that was just three computers. The other one was called the eight pack. And the idea of that was that you put very um, eight different. You'd have one master um, PC sitting at the top. You'd have a load of like what they're called now razors, but um, motherboards in this slim mount tray stacked underneath the main one, and then a rack of drives. And then a really high speed network connecting them all up and then connecting to the next box. So you could just mount multiple units. Now, this was hypothetical. I designed the cases and I've done everything, but I never actually made one. And I should have probably made the clustering system because um, whilst I only ever made a couple of prototypes of the three pack and, and then, then kind of realized it was just too big, I'd had, a, I'd had a call from NASA saying they were interested in my eight packs but because I hadn't built it they went well we like the idea so we'll make our own but that was that 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 might have sent me down a completely different path well you mentioned about you know the obviously the deal with Gateway falling through and yeah. then kind of closing the company down and I guess at that time you you know probably took a step back from the Amiga for a while and yeah. you know around that time as well after Gateway I mean I remember I kind of lost interest in the Amiga around 2000 2001 didn't really pay attention to it for a, almost a decade, really. Then when I came back into it, it was a very different world. I mean, what kind of got you back into the Amiga scene and how did you find things were were different when you, you re-emerged? So, right, I, I this is what I was saying to Rabbi about being careful what I say so I don't get too emotional. After the Gateway thing, everything fell apart and I literally threw out everything to do with Amigas except my 1000. I put it in a box, left it in the garage and... Uh, and literally, I, 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 you probably remember a guy called Tony Ian Erie from Power Computing. Yeah. So I went to see, he called me to come around one day and he knew what was going on. And he sat me down. He did that Italian father figure thing. He said, Steve, sit down. He said, you got a family. Go and get a job. So I took his advice. And I, and of course, the internet was starting then. And I got in touch with, um, uh, I got a first job, you know, to, to uh, the I went first interview. I went straight into a, a job doing people's internets. Now I ended up up and well, I've been I was writing software up until about nine months ago, actually, for the whole period. Um, but my my interest came back about two thousand and seven, two thousand six, seven, something like that, because I saw Aros. If uh, Stepping back to what I said a little while ago, my, my aim was always to get the Amiga's operating system ported to x86. I, that's what I wanted to do because I knew, I know most people go, oh, they get upset about saying that, but an x86, high-speed graphics with a fantastic Amiga operating system couldn't beat it. But what happened over those years while I was away, um, a team of really clever guys have been slowly working on, it's basically a complete, open source rewrite of uh, Amiga OS 3.1 from the ground up. So it's completely clean room, um, which basically means they didn't see the operating system. And they, But you can take existing um, 3.1 source code and with your, within, you know, a short period of time, have it running, uh, recompile it under AROS and it will run just like as an Amiga. So... Um, AWOS is, has, has always been to me my life, absolutely fantastic because it's not owned by anyone. It's not held, not held up by any legal rubbish. And it's been, it was doing really well. So I, I spent, I, I had a bit of guilt because if you remember what I said earlier, I'd taken about 45, 50 deposits from people and I tracked some of them down. And I always say, if you were one of them people, get in touch with me and then I'll, and I'll, I'll refund it and make it, you know, well worth your while. So I always had this bit of guilt and I thought, well, you know, things have straightened themselves out. So what can I do to help? I, I couldn't really write the code because I was, I'm not a C, a, a C, C programmer. I'm not, not good enough to do that, uh, but I can fund it. So I started paying for graphics drivers and sound drivers and I paid for the HD audio system and I paid for um, Michael Shores to do the, um, uh, Intel uh, GMA 
um, graphics drivers. And then I funded a load of network drivers. And I did about 60, 50 or 60 videos all about AROS over the coming years. And so really, I was just literally banging on about how good AROS was and, you know, trying to get people. Now, recently, it's kind of tailed off a little inch. I think everyone's interest now is just literally 68K. Everyone loves 68K now, and it's kind of gone back on itself now. But AROS is this fantastic operating system that runs on, it runs on 68K, which is what the Vampire team are using. It runs on x86. There's even a version for ARM. There's one for PowerPC. Um, and it really is open source. And to me, it's the, it is the way forward. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting seeing that you've, you've kind of helped promote it and also, you know, help fund it as well, which is... Uh, so, to a degree, I put a few thousand into drivers and that because I always said, because people always say to me, oh, what can I do? I said, well, first thing you do is you can, if, you, if you've used it and you'd like a piece of software, just email the developer and say, thanks, I think it's great. Yeah. Most of them are happy with that. They just like to, instead of people, re- you know, contact and saying, oh, this doesn't work. It's rubbish. Why don't you just say it's fantastic and then send in a bug report? It's a nice way of doing it. Well, when did you kind of decide uh, to crazily, you know, re-enter the Amiga business and uh, (laughs) uh, start Checkmate? It must have been quite a a, a tough decision uh, to dip into it. No, no, no. No, it's quite funny because. So, a a bit of backstory. I've worked for a guy called um, Edmund Swain, and up until about six months ago, and I he, he retired about. 18 months, 18 months ago, something like that. So for a couple of two or three years before he was going to retire, uh, I, I, as, as you probably gathered, I had all my eggs in one basket months before, and I wasn't going to do that again with this job because uh, no one was going to hire a 60 year old programmer. So I thought, well, I'll have a go and I'll, uh, I'll I wouldn't mind. I wanted to m- make something. Um, and it just so happened that David started talking about doing his first book and, um, I thought, well, oh, maybe if I design the case I've always wanted to do, because as I said, I, <clears throat> I didn't design the original. And whilst it was a great little product, it was t- to me there was lots of things lacking, and it was it was it was cute, but it it it, well, it could look a lot better, um, and it could be more expandable, etc. And I thought well, I'll just make my own, um, and then you know if anything happens, then maybe it'll turn into something. So uh, I designed the original one in SketchUp. But I shared it on Facebook and set up a group, and people went nuts over it. And it really, it did surprise me. I mean, people that came out of the woodwork because nowadays, in the old days, people just wanted to play games. But nowadays, people love experimenting, building hardware, making their Amiga as cool as possible. And so they remembered the old one. I thought, well, with David bringing out the book, maybe I can do this and launch, and and his he'll be some PR for me. Uh, as it turned out. Um, it took a while, and I I'd actually launched my Kickstarter before his one, and shipped it before his book came out, and it sold. I think we we sold about seven hundred cases in the Kickstarter, and I, up to date, I think I've sold about fifteen hundred, sixteen hundred cases, which is like five times more than the original one. And it, but again, it's it's just that. I, I, I expanded on its functionality. So instead of just putting an Amiga in it, obviously you could put all your, your 500, 600, 1200s in. You could put like a PC in it. You could put, um, you know, uh, build yourself a really powerful NVIDIA powered machine. Like Dave Haney's got one in his um, summer house and he, he, he used it, which, is, which was really lovely actually. So he's got one. So a lot of people build actual working machines and Amigas and, and I get more pleasure out of seeing what people do with them I absolutely, absolutely love it. But when Edmund retired, you know, I, I tried to continue, but it, it wasn't going to work out with the other director. He's a lovely bloke, but it was never going to work going forward. And then uh, I kind of decided that, I, you know, I think it was about six, no, I was getting on for a year now. I uh, decided I'd just go and do this on my own. You know, that that was then the risk. Because up until that point, it had been a hobby, nothing more. Mm. Hobby, it made some money contributed to one of my mobile bikes, paid for holidays for the family, bought kids things, that kind of th- that kind of thing. Um, but there was it, there was enough money coming in to to um, to tick over, let's put it that way. So I I, I that, at that point I thought, no, okay, we'll we'll give it a go. And that's when it became serious. And that's when I decided I needed another product in the to to, to make another product. 
I mean, the case is, I mean, people have probably seen LGR's video. I mean, that, that was really big. Pretty much everyone that's interactor, I'm sure, watches LGR and saw the video I did on, on your case as well. And I imagine the audience is slightly different now. I mean, back when you originally released the cases 30 years ago, it was people trying to expand their Amiga 500 into a, a more professional machine to maybe use in business. Whereas today, I mean, it's maybe more the hobbyist market. It's people that Completely. miss the desktop kind of look of machines. Because, you know, it's quite hard to get a desktop um, machine these days. It's mostly tower cases. And... You've got so many different options in there. You mentioned Amigas, PCs can go in there, Raspberry Pis as well. So tell us a bit about kind of the, the technology and manufacturing process and what it's been like trying to accommodate so many different <laughs> options. That must have been difficult. <laughs> well, yeah, it was. So the first case, um, I, I, I always knew that um, it was going to have to have injection molded parts. We didn't do that on the first 1500 which was very limiting. That's why it's got that front face with a slight angle to make it look a bit, little bit more pretty. But I wanted it to look, and I, and as I've said before, my favourite Amiga is the 3000. I think it's also one of the best-looking computers ever made. And I wanted to rip it off. <laughs> I wanted to make it – I wanted to make a machine that looked – and you'd have to do a double take. Even if you stick them side by side, you can see mine's a lot wider. So, but it was very complex um, to, to design because the first thing was you could have – I had to have five – no, sorry, four completely independent rear panel designs. So the insides um, were basically the same, but I had to put mount holes, the studs, uh, called standoffs. I had to put them for like a 1,200 – 500 or 600, all the holes for the motherboard. Then I had to do it for all the mini ITX, micro ITX. So all these standoffs, then you screw a brass insert that raises the particular ones you're going to use. And the motherboard then mounts up a back to a custom rear panel, which has got all the ports. So there was a there's a panel for the 500 with all the ports. There's one for the 1200 and the 600 at the same time. Then there's, um, uh, luckily the PCs have a standard interface. There's a micro ATX one, uh, which can take mini ITX. And then, but there's one with horizontal cards and one with vertical half height cards. So they all had to work. Um, that was the, the rear panels were the reason why, um, if, if, if you remember, well, quite often people uh, don't read the manual, but uh, you, because of the way it's designed, the, the rear lid has to come back and then tip down at 45 degrees and then slide down. And that's mm. because the design of the rear panels, because of the way we had to screw the panel, because you screw the rear panels in. And because of that, it meant we, we couldn't just slide straight off. It was impossible. And uh, so that's the first thing people go, clonk. <laughs> and they say, oh, this is rubbish. Um, but it was just, it was a side effect of that. But, you know, once people realised, then, the, then they didn't care. Um, but that was it. And then, of course, then the front panel, the injection molded, my God. Um, I think they cost about 45 Fifty thousand dollars for the tooling, and very nerve nerve wracking. Because the good thing is, that at the time, three D printing was just coming, not just coming out; it'd been out for a while, but high end stuff. So, the three D parts that I was getting printed, they they were almost once they sprayed them, they looked almost like the the actual injection molded parts. So it was fantastic for testing. But ultimately, uh, the Kickstarter meant I could actually do the tooling. And and we, as I said, we we sold lows, and it tended to be fifty fifty black and white. But the plus is still the the most popular. With the mini people like the mini, but of course it's not as flexible. It's just literally mini ITX case, and unless you've got a reason for buying it, most people don't. Most people buy the plus and put a, an Amiga in it, or a, you know, like a high end PC. Well, you've got um quite quite a team of engineers as well helping you you know uh, i saw rob cranley helped you with the zorro stuff which is just absolutely amazing and you've also got a new project which is a, a monitor coming out as well yeah. has that required a lot of um thought and uh, you know prototyping so i i want to add another engineer in there 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 was um obviously rob i mean without rob the the the, the 1500 plus would never have happened because I, I had to. I wanted that Zorro time. And I wanted to be able to board it. So it was three boards he did, which was the LED board, the power board, and the Zorro board. And he, he designed all of them, and he still to this day he he uh, he all sorts out all my ordering for me for the circuit boards and cables, which is fantastic. Um, 
but there's also um, I don't know if you remember the the Mystics for the Mini, which was a D10 system. That was done by Edu Arana, um, a fantastic engineer from Spain, um, and he helped me. Did a couple of uh, great boards um, for the for the Mini. Um, we've kind of done it a different way now, um, but yeah, he, he, his his balls were absolutely fantastic. Now onto the monitor, of course. Um, Explain a bit about what the monitor is as well for people that might yeah, not have seen it. The, okay, so the, I suppose the, the 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 idea for me was this: that well, I've got loads of these ninety, you know, sixteen nine panels floating. Around. I've got loads of them. You know, I look at three of them on my my machine where I'm sitting now, and um, but they just don't look right on the computers and. And I suppose the first thing I've got to say is I wasn't trying to, I get this all the time. People think I'm trying to um, recreate the CRT and I'm not, not at all. Cause I have a different perspective because CRT destroyed my eyes back in the day. Cause I didn't play games. I used to watch demos, um, but I, everything was in interlace cause I had to get the high resolution because it did my eyes. In. So I have a different perspective on them, but I think that's the reason that I need, I needed laser, laser eye surgery <laughs> when I was like 25 actually. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> They were absolute killers for your eyes. They're brilliant if you're playing low resolution games. Um, they are. They do look um, outstanding for low resolution games. But anything else, I don't like them. But I wanted something that had that charm, you know, because that this big, big monitor, you know, the the aspect ratio is very important. You know, the five four four three with aspect ratios is crucial. And also, you wanted something that looked good on the computer because I'm a big box guy, right? It's, everyone knows that. Um, and so having the, you know, the box and the keyboard in front and the monitor on top, I wanted to, to make something that looked right, but I didn't want to make the whole point was I wanted it to have depth, but not for no reason. I don't want it, I don't, I don't want it to have a big hole in the back and, you know, you can you put your crisps in it or something. It had to be for a reason. And so I, I, I came to the thought, I thought, well, you know, what would be fantastic because everyone wants to put different kinds of interfaces, you know, Sky interfaces, S video interfaces, all this kind of stuff. Um, maybe they want to put a, uh, um, a small board, um, an SBC single board computer into it, or maybe a Mister or a Mini Mig or something like that. And so I came up with the idea. I nicked the word pods. I'm probably going to get sued one day because it was done by a, a call. But I like the idea of calling them pods. So the first one is the um, is the controller, which is the panel controller, and it was much more simple than it is now. I'll get on to happy in a minute um but it was much more simple i basically picked a really good controller that had some brilliant audio visual like uh, composite inputs you know and it had hdmi and vga and that was good and then we could add in extra bits to do for example scart and i worked with a great guy called byron who made an interface for um, gbs control which we maybe come back to which is a way of using um this is our cable called the gbs 8200 and it basically converts 15 kilohertz arcade signals into vga outputs um but it's okay it, it did a reasonable job and people have been using them for amigas for a while but then this uh microcontroller came out that replaced the firmware and took over control and it had transformed it so putting the two together with the SCART interface that was the second pod so you could then have SCART and you could have component and you can have um we've now got EGA. now this is this, it was still fairly simple with a small board. But then, of course, uh, Appy got in touch. He likes me to call him Appy. So that's, uh, that's not his name. Um, but he, he doesn't like people calling him his real name, so I'm not going to. And uh, he called, called me and said, go over and sing. Because he'd actually bought one of my 1500 pluses and put a Commodore 128 in it. So mm. I don't know if you remember the 128. Uh, yeah, lovely machine. Yeah, so he actually built it in and he put everything in it. It was just amazing. He wanted me to go and see it. Um, so I went over and we had a chat, and he, but he wanted to help with the monitor because he's done an awful lot of research and work on uh, converting retro machines to work with like more modern like VGA signals and learn all about that. And so we had a, a big discussion about it. And, Anyway, so we've spent we spent like the first before the Kickstarter, we did a lot of experimentation, and uh, thought, okay, we can probably do this the way we want to do it. Um, the Kickstarter launched. Still not one hundred percent sure whether I was going to go down this other route. Now, the the new route that we're following, and we are going down this route now, is basically I'm not sure if the back plane is going to be part of the stat. It may be an inexpensive upgrade because of cost factors. But basically, the, mo the monitor now has a backplane 
with three big slots. They look like Amiga video slots, to be honest. And basically what you do is you, the, the cards plug in and using VGA is your main control system. And all the audio visual signals go up and down the bus. So you put the, the first card in, which is the main controller, and that's, we call it slot zero. That's where all the magic happens on that base card. But you've still got two more slots. So if you've got, um, say, for example, I can mention this, uh, um, Minimig, the Minimig team um, have already done an ITX version of Minimig, you know, the one with the 68K chip on it. Yeah, yeah. They're doing uh, going to do a custom version with slot to plug in. Uh, with so you can plug a Pi Storm in it, so you're basically going to have a mini MIG with a Pi Storm, and all you do is you plug it into the back of the monitor, and it turns it into the fastest MIG you, you're probably ever going to see. And so then you've still got a spare slot where you can put in the GPS control and add a whole load of ports. So the idea was to make it really expandable, um, and that space is being used now. But we also there's a whole load of other things we we do with like for example. Um, mono modes so you can switch it into mono mode it can be green screen it could be an amber screen it can be you know, all that kind of stuff we're playing experimenting with because some people want to use it as a teletype not teletype um terminal ter- yes that's it that's the word yeah. i was for terminal uh just for fun you know and so we're 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 doing all that kind of stuff uh, and it's in the right aspect ratio we want to be able to plug in for example you know like uh, next machines into it so which i think is sync on green um, and there's silicon graphics and some of these old machines that you can't get monitors. I mean, give an example. You can't buy a machine these days that will do CGA and EGA. Mm. Okay, well, if you buy a, a, a second board and plug it in there, it's got a socket for CGA and EGA. So you can run those old machines. So that's the that's the idea of it, um, to build a really stupidly flexible monitor with a great panel. But then, of course, then I suppose the big thing everyone asks is, can you get it in black? I say, yep. You can get it in black. It comes in 17-inch and 19-inch. So if you want the real retro big fat bezel, you get the 17-inch. And if you want more screen because your eyesight's as bad as mine, then you get the 19-inch. Um, but, yeah, so it's, de- it's coming out in black. But people say, why Why don't you make a black prototype? I say, well, because the photographs, you couldn't see it. <laughs> yeah, it, good point. You can't take a picture of a black monitor. You never, they never come out any good. So the white ones, the shadows work brilliantly. Well, Steve, I think it's incredible that you're doing so much, you know, it's particularly, it goes beyond the Amiga now as well, doesn't it? You know, like you said, the console market in there, the retro PC market as well. And, you know, from seeing you at shows as well, kind of getting back into all this again, you know, three decades on, are you having more fun this time around? Because you just seem in your, in your element whenever I see you at shows. <laughs> um, it's less stress. I'm more grown. I'm, I'm, I'm wiser. And uh, where is back in the... <laughs> Back in the, it took me quite a long time to make the jump. I mean, it's like two and a half years before I made the jump going full time. Whereas back in the day, I'd have sold, I'd have sold three computers and gone, I'm going to go into business. You know, it took me a long time to actually convince myself to do it. But um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm having an absolute whale of the time. The best thing is with the Kickstarter, and I can't recommend it enough. And um, I, you know, I always, I always advising people on how to run a Kickstarter because it's, it takes as long as you get your maths right. You must get your maths right. As long as you get your maths right, it takes all that pressure away. It's not like the old days where you used to have to go to a bank manager and say, can I borrow some money and put your house up? Yeah. And then you don't know if you're going to sell the parts. You've already pre-sold them. Mm. So it, that stress is taken away. I mean, I know I'm, you know, we're, we're, we're targeted to ship these, but, you know, Q, Q4, you know, this year. But I, I don't have to worry because all the money, sit, it's all sitting in the bank. It's just sitting there waiting for me to turn on the manufacturing. Um, and, we, and we can just keep working on, you know, improving the product. I mean, we were on version two of the boards. We got another version three of the um, interface boards being done at the moment. I got a new a version four of the chassis being made in a couple of weeks because I know it's a couple of issues with um, the V3, which I showed the last, the last weekend. Um, but it's 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 just great. I just love it. It's just great fun, and it's and now it's, it's the actual enjoyment because I like making things, and you know I'm like anyone else. You know I'm probably sensitive. If someone says it's rubbish, you know I get you know get a bit insulted. But um, but most people when they come up, they you know they 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 they're shocked at you know the um, the the display. I think the display is always the thing. Isn't it? They like the look of mm. it, but it's the it's the brightness of the display, and they really like and. Um, everyone comments on it. 
Well, if people want to get get a look at that. Are you going to be at many shows over summer? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to Ravi's. Yeah, <laughs> Kickstarter, Kickstarter UK. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I'm <laughs> absolutely. I'm looking forward to that one. Um, <laughs> but I'm doing. I, as I said, I just came back from um, the one in Norwich. I've got uh, Retcon in June. I've got Kickstart weekend in. Is it first week July. of July? Yep. Yeah. Uh, and then Amiga 38 in October. Mm. So uh, I'm doing quite a few. And uh, the, the October one's going to be interesting because it's potentially in the middle of me shipping. So, but the, um, yeah, I think the, um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the uh, the Kickstart one because it's, it's just going to be like the old days. I mean, um, well, well, that's one of the things I've tried to recreate. You know, I used to go to these old shows. And uh, I was I was a young lad, but I would see you on stage, and uh, you had that enthusiasm, Steve. So it's great to see that you're still enthusiastic and enjoying it. Yeah, I mean, people people often think because I always tell people I'm I am actually very shy. I mean, I and this is the God's honest truth, okay? That people come to my stand and they see this loud, powerful yopo that comes from London with that dodgy London accent. But actually, when I when I leave the stand, if I, I'm always too shy to go and talk to. I have to. I, I'm always too shy to talk to people. And in fact, the, the funny thing is, uh, when I did the, the original OLL, I booked that show for one specific reason that I wanted to um, for um, nostalgia nerd to come along and see the monitors. And uh, <laughs> I chickened out. I've all passed this stand about four times and chickened out saying hello. So uh, eventually, at the end of the second day, he came over. And he had a good look, and of course, you know, he said it to a video, and then it was like the last week of the Kickstart, and it, it literally we was about sixty percent. I thought we was going to fail with a few days left, and his video video dropped, and uh, next day it doubled. Yeah, that was amazing to see. Yeah, um, just because we got the coverage, and um, so that that was outstanding. That says it all, Steve. You know, your products speak for themselves. You know, yes. everyone I've spoken to loves what you're doing. So long, may it continue. And uh, thank you so much for coming on and uh, reminiscing with us a bit and uh, best of luck with it all and I'm sure we'll see you at um, plenty of shows over the summer as well Steve yeah thanks so much it's been good fun 